Hello, everybody. It's Tara here coming at you from um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I don't know where you are listening from, but if you're in this area, it's kind of one of those dark, gloomy kind of afternoons where you just want to be um, at home in front of a fireplace with some hot tea and a book, or at least I do. Um, but despite that, I actually am really excited to um, give you some information today and talk a little bit about information literacy in our classrooms and how we can develop um, really the next generation of critical thinkers that are able to evaluate um, the tools and information that's out there. So important today. So thank you so much for joining me for this. I know it's um, not only, you know, just teacher time in general is really valuable and it's a stressful job, but this year in particular, as we all know, is really, just really tough. So I appreciate so much you taking some time out to talk about this topic with me today. So um, we'll be here for 30 minutes. I'm really good about making sure you end on time, even if it means I have to speed talk toward the end. Um, but I want to go over a few uh, frequently asked questions, housekeeping items. So first, I want to introduce you to Heather. She's on the back end. You want to say hi, Heather? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. So Heather is there to help answer any chat questions or um, tech questions that come along. So feel free to use the chat or the question feature, whatever your particular browser serves you up for, um, for this. So if you have any trouble, she can help you there. I also want to let you know that all of the resources that I show you today are in this one handout. So um, I think Heather's going to throw that into the chat right now. So you can either click on it if you like to follow along that in the chat. You can scan this if you want to do it from your phone. Um, or you can just type it in. But all the resources, like I said, are there. Um, so um, feel free to use that during the webinar or afterwards. And our most frequently asked question is, will this be recorded? And the answer is yes. So as soon as this is done, we you know, spit out a recording. And then um, probably tomorrow, at least by Friday, you will get an email with a link to the recording. You can feel free to share that with anybody you'd like or to revisit it if that's helpful to you. All right, so I like to get a little sense of who is here with us today. So we'll put up a quick poll here. Um, with just trying to look for what grade levels do you teach? Are you an early elementary teacher, late elementary, three, five, middle school, high school, nine, 12, or maybe you are, um, you know, administrator, more K-12 kind of um, span. So if you'll take maybe just 30 seconds here and we will see where we're all coming at from a grade level perspective. <clears throat> it's always nice to see how this spans out. All right, Heather, if you feel like they stopped coming in, let's see what we got. Yeah, so we have about 6% early elementary, 31% late elementary, 50% middle school, 6% high school, and 19% other or admin. Okay, perfect. So mostly middle school, also some late elementary in there, and a little bit of um, folks. So I think that's great. I'll um, tailor some of these examples as it's appropriate to maybe a little more middle school, but um, I think that will these resources will definitely fit in those age spans. So, um, and I also just want to thank you guys for paying attention to Blue Apple. If you're at all interested in project-based learning or kind of applying these concepts and sort of bigger picture projects that engage students in making the world a better place, I definitely encourage you to check those out. And in fact, I'll give you a chance to win one at the end of the webinar. They're really cool projects that take a lot of the time out of um, PBL, which can be pretty time consuming. So hopefully that's a help to you. So what we'll spend the rest of our time on today is looking at, for a little bit, I mean, obviously, if you come to the web, I think you think information literacy is important already, but I'll give you a little bit of information about why I think it's important and that might help, you know, bring it home for you or share it with others if you need to. And then I'm going to share with you four activities, sort of games um, and um, quests that you can do in your classroom that we put together that I'm really excited about, and they've been really successful. Um, they use, each one takes anywhere from five minutes to maybe 20 minutes top. So they're short games you can do that really do build those critical thinking and information literacy skills, and a few bonus strategies for you as well. And then we'll end by looking at kind of the bigger picture of incorporating information literacy into really meaningful projects for your students. And as I mentioned, we will give a chance to win a free Blue Apple project for three of you. <clears throat> so I just want to kind of address like what I started with. It's a really tough year and I just I can't um, emphasize that enough. I think we're trying to straddle these worlds of obviously trying to keep teaching and learning in the forefront. That's what we're here to do. But we're also, you know, being asked to cover for subs that people can't find or bus duty or lunch duty or every other duty under the sun and asking more kids to come into our classroom because we can't find a sub and just endless number of things, not to mention keeping up with all the kids who are out in quarantine and getting them assignments. You know, it's just, you know, if you think back, it wasn't that long ago when we thought, oh, you know, 21, 22 school year, it's going to be back to normal. Won't it be great to come back in person and 
very quickly realized that it's not it's not normal. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that I don't have a silver bullet for you for that, but I do acknowledge that it's just really tough for all of us right now. So I again thank you for spending some time to think about this topic. That I think even though we're in this crazy world of just trying to get by, this is a topic that I think is super meaningful for um, for our kids and for our society. So I think carving some time out for it. Um, can be a real kind of respite, a real sort of bright spot where we feel successful. So that's what I would hope for you in this, and particularly in this sort of turbulent time. So thinking about the question about why is information literacy important, I'm sure you may have seen this meme out there from Abraham Lincoln here saying, people will believe anything they read on the internet. And it's funny, you know, hopefully you get the joke there, but I wonder how many of your kids would just very you know easily just pass this on and think that they're just doing the world a service in fact you can try it send it give it to your kids and see how many of them will pass it on you know it's it's surprising how many are willing to do that um so that's you know just the fact that the people are so willing to share something like that that's so obviously an error um i think just kind of highlights one reason this is important but i also think it's it's kind of interesting to tackle this question as we kick this off um so we'll put up another poll here and that's in the information age Finding high quality information is, would you say it's easier or harder than it used to be? I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer here, but I'm just curious. It's something to kind of ponder as we kick this off. Do you think that finding information, finding high quality information is easier or harder than it used to be? This is a pretty quick one. So Heather, I think we can probably go ahead and close it out and see, see what we ended up with. Yeah, so 33% think it's easier, 67% think it's harder. Yeah, I think you can make an argument either way, right? But it's an interesting question, like I said. I mean, there's no question there's more information. There's no question it's faster and easier to get to, but that just means there's more to sift through and it's maybe harder to know what's true and what's not true. And there's different uh, motivations out there. Sometimes things are untrue purposefully and sometimes they're untrue just by mistake. So I think you can definitely make a case. I would probably, having done this webinar, I'm kind of lean a little bit more towards saying it's harder. Um, but you can also acknowledge the fact that it is great to live in an age where there is so much information. I mean, just think how, you know, when we were growing up, maybe if you wanted to find something out, you had to go find your, you know, encyclopedia, volume, whatever, you know? So it is, in that respect, easier. I won't read all these to you, but suffice it to say, definitely the research is keeping up with this as well, right? There's research and um, outside entities, um, academic entities that are looking at this and talking about the importance of information literacy and how it's becoming a component of all literate societies and how, you know, children need to be able to not just read information, but be able to work out what they can trust and how they should place that information um, in their trust and identify sources that are actually, um, you know, credible. And I like this last one in particular, when citizens fail to understand how information is organized and accessed, they lose the freedom to seek and critically analyze information for themselves, the freedom to make personally informed decisions on political and social issues, and the freedom to make an enlightened contribution to the body of human knowledge. So I like this kind of tying it to freedom, you know, that if we don't have as a society that fundamental ability to, um, you know, know whether our sources are, are true, we lose the freedom to kind of make good decisions. So I kind of boil down practically what does that mean for you and your students, you know, developing information literacy, I think provides these benefits to them that are benefits that are going to make you that teacher that they remember for a long, long time. So it builds those problem solving and critical thinking skills, empowers them to learn for themselves, right? Again, that goes back to that freedom piece of it, improves their decision making. Obviously, if they have credible information, they can make good decisions. It's something that's going to, you know, equip them for success, not just in school, but in their later careers. It's definitely something that employers are looking for the skill in people and just in life, right? To be feel like they have that, um, that confidence in what they are able to intake in terms of information. I think this is a big one too, help students deal with information overload, right? There is so much information out there. So if they have some skills to sort of, you know, kind of weed through it and see what they can separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will, then that helps them with that overload. Encourages them, to be um, careful evaluators of their sources and look for bias or inaccuracy, obviously, and fosters successful learners, confident individuals, and effective contributors to society, right? Our goal here is to make these little humans into people that are gonna actually advance um, our, our society. And I think that this is a really key piece of this. It doesn't fall you know, squarely in math, 
English language arts, reading um, social studies or science, let's say, but in every discipline, somewhere along the line, you're gonna to need to access information and you're gonna be able to determine if it's credible. And I don't need to tell you this, but it's not just about getting, you know, having wrong information and being wrong, but there are some serious consequences of failures in information literacy. And I purposely stayed away from any domestic US headlines. So, because I don't wanna make this political. There are, you know, misinformations on both sides of the political aisles, outside of politics, but just to see across the world, this is actually a problem. So these are headlines taken from around the world, from around the world um, within the last year, I believe, <clears throat> at least the last couple of years. When fake news kills, lynchings in Mexico are linked to viral child kidnap rumors. How misinformation on WhatsApp led to a mob killing in India. Fake news driving ethno-religious crisis in Nigeria. So this is not a problem that is unique to the United States, although it is certainly very, very rampant here in the United States, but it's also around the world. And lastly, on this kind of, you know, why is this important? I think it's also interesting to note that it's not necessarily new. It's easy to think that because information is so prevalent now and easy to access that this is a new phenomenon, but it's actually been around a while. And this is kind of a fun website, the social historian here, um, that has a lot of these sort of fake news articles from back in history. And this was, I think, the one that spoke to me the most, which was uh, apparently there was a rumor publicized out there that Mark Twain was dead. And so he actually took out an ad and Mark Twain amused. Humorous says he even heard on good authority that he was dead. Apparently it was his cousin that was sick, not him. But, you know, it's been around a while, which is, you know, at once kind of heartening, like this isn't something new, but it's also sort of disheartening in that I don't think it's ever going to go away either. So what can you do about it? We gathered some ideas, we put together some, some resources that I want to share with you that I think um, will make for not only developing some informationally literate citizens, but also create some curiosity, creativity, critical thinking in your classroom, and hopefully have a little bit of fun along the way. So here is a link. I'm gonna actually go out to this website and show you these lessons. These are available for free. You can go um, right now and follow along with that, or you can just follow you know, as I take you on the screen. I'm going to find my mouse. There it is, and go here. So this is um, what we call one of our timely topics. We put these out each month. Let's check my time. And I wanna take you through, there's four, we call them mini lessons. Like I said, some are five minutes, um, some maybe up to 20 minutes and some you can expand in there, but they're just short little mini lessons that you can do on that particular topic. So I'm gonna take you through each one of these. The first one, super simple. It's called, Do You Dare? And I'm gonna take you to that now. And it's just a simple, um, this first you know, page will just kind of introduce you to it and then we'll take you out to a little Google slideshow. All of these, by the way, are made in Google. You can make a copy and make any changes that you would like to if you want to better them, customize them, make them your own. So just a quick little exercise to kind of show students um, how they can't always believe what they see. So this is a fun thing to just show them this, um, this picture and say, look at this guy just like hang on the edge of this cliff, right? Pretty scary. Would you be willing to do this? Have them talk about that. Check out this girl, right? She's really living on the edge here. Is she crazy? What do you think is happening here? Right, this little kid out here on the ledge, would they be willing to do that? So these fun um, pictures of this particular image. So you ask them whether this is something they would like to do, and then you could kind of take them a little bit deeper into the picture and show a little bit more context. And you start to realize, oh, it's not that scary after all, right? It's got a little, um, a little floor underneath it, and then, you could um, just kind of have a discussion around that, right? How like, did you, can you always believe what you see? And if you wanna take that even further, um, you can actually encourage them to create their own kind of image. And here's some few examples, right? That isn't quite believing what you see. So just a quick little activity to show, um, you know, how you can't always believe what you see. So that's do you dare. The second one is more of a protocol that you can teach and have your kids apply. So this is really a practical kind of idea to um, share with your students and they could apply this then to any information um, well, source that they see out there. So it's basically the crap protocol. And if you have, sometimes you have a you know, group of kids who would think that's hilarious and you can get all the giggles out and it'll be fine and they'll remember it. And others you like, I can't even mention that. My kids will be off. So you can always change it to trap instead of a C if you don't like that acronym. And I'll show you how. Essentially, um, it stands for, C is for currency, or if you wanna use TRAP, you can use TIMELY. Um, basically, how new is the, is the resource? Relevance, um, you know, how, how relevant is the source is unrelated to your topic or related to your topic? 
Authority, is the author an expert or are they someone that's unknown? Accuracy, do the facts seem incorrect? Does it seem supported by other sources? And then purpose, you know, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to sell you something? You know, that's looking for bias. So this is just kind of, like I said, a protocol. And then this gives you the opportunity to um, help them think about why that's important. And then there are a couple of sources out there, a couple of websites that are created and the kids can use the CRAP protocol to see whether they think that site is fact or fiction. And of course, it'll give you the answers. News alert flash to you, they are both fiction. Um, but it's interesting, you know, some of it maybe look clearly, you know, not true, but others are a little harder to tell. So that could be an exercise that you do with your students to give them that protocol. Again, something that they can use for any sources as they move forward in their school or work careers. And then the last two are my favorite. These are more game-like. So the first one of the games is called the Quest for Truth. And in this one, I'll take you to the activity. You come to, here's your instructions, but I'm gonna walk you through it. I think of these a lot like board games, right? It's just so much easier if somebody walks you through it. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you right to the slideshow that's here, but everything I'll tell you is in that instruction sheet. So essentially what you would do is you're gonna print out these um, quests and treasure hunts. So there are six quests. You would tell the kids they're gonna go through these six different quests. And with each quest, they will have a choice to answer you know, from treasure chest one or treasure chest two. And when they get the correct answer, it gives them a letter that they're gonna put in here. And that will, um, they can unscramble those letters to get the secret that will take them to the answer. So their whole quest is essentially the pirates are you know, falling victim to scurvy. How are we gonna help them? The mistress of misinformation is spreading all kinds of bad information about how to stop this disease. So they have to be able to tell which information is accurate and not accurate. So they go through their quests. I'll give you a quick kind of example just because it makes it easier to do it on your own. So one of these quests, you might have this printed around the room. They can start at any given place. They don't have to go in order. And so in this one, the kids learn that you know we've searched high and low, but the only pirate place, um, pirate map that gets us to our destination has gone missing. It's important that we create an accurate map so that we can get our sick pirates to the mainland to treat their scurvy. Your options are, we have a pirate on the ship that is a cartographer, you know, a matey who creates maps professionally. And then we also have one who is an artist that thinks he remembers how to get to our destination. So which do you think we should use, right? The cartographer or the artist? So this is a more simpler one. So if they think it's the cartographer, they can go to treasure map one. And so we did this one with QR codes, but there's also an option if you don't have one-to-one -one devices where you can print out the answer and you can do it as a lift and flip. So there's a, an analog version as well. And so essentially they choose one or two, if they get it wrong, they can go back and go to the other one. But they're seeing, you know, whether it's understanding your source or whether it's understanding um, whether the information is accurate or the author is credible, different, you know, pieces of information literacy, they go through that process. And then in the end, they um, get the letters and it spells out lemons. And so that's when they learn about, um, you know, vitamin C and how that prevents scurvy. So it's a really fun activity to get them around the room and exploring these different ways that people can use to misinform you. Okay, and then I'm gonna do the last one really fast here, which is cases to crack. And so in this one, it's another kind of game-like activity. And in this one, again, you come to your instructions here, and it also has a QR code version and a physical playing card version. And what I love about this one is it's more than just information literacy. It really gets at those just sort of reasoning and critical thinking skills in, the, in a game format. So I'll take you to the different slideshows that go along with this one. So if we're gonna do the QR code version, you come to this page as a teacher and you have the option to show a slideshow. And then once you show that slideshow, you're going to go to um, this assigner um, spreadsheet that I'll show you that's gonna assign them a perspective. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I'll take you to the slideshow first. This is what you would show the kids. <clears throat> you're going to show the kids. This case is, um, we call it the case of the vase. And this is more, I would say, elementary focused. There's also a middle school focused one that's a little bit higher level um, scenario or crime that's taken place. But in this case, um, I'll just take you quickly through the scenario. In our classroom, a vase was shattered. And I heard a story. I heard that it was Maria who broke the vase. And so they need to find out whether the story is true. So the teacher, you, and I'll show you how in a minute, are gonna give them a perspective. They're gonna see either John's perspective, Miles' perspective, Marco's, or Violet's, and there's others as well. And they're gonna read that perspective, and then they're gonna share it with someone else. And they're gonna determine whose do you think is more credible? And I'll show you an example of how they can do that. And the one that they think is more credible, 
then they scan that code and they take on that perspective. So the hope is here that they learn that good, true news can spread if you use your critical thinking and your information literacy. But also if you don't use it, then bad news or misinformation can also spread. So you can see if you can get the right information spreading to solve the case of the base, if whether or not Maria actually um, broke the base or not. So let me show you how that works. So that's the slideshow to kind of introduce it to the kids. Um, coming back, I think I'll just finish that out for you. So it tells them how they're gonna do that. And at the end, you're gonna decide, is Maria innocent or is she guilty, right? So that's the little slideshow for the kids. And then I think this is super cool and a fun little time saver for you is the assigner. So I've gone ahead, it goes to a spreadsheet and you can make a copy for yourself. And I have gone ahead and made a copy over here and filled it with my classroom of celebrities. So we'll show you that here. So as soon as you put your class names in here, it's going to give the link to a certain, you know, um, person's perspective from the storyline. So I'll show you here, Beyonce has John's perspective. So John is going to say, um, he's saying that she's innocent, right? That this rumor is not true. No way it was Maria. Um, what about the way Jordan broke the hamster cage and she never got punished for it, even though everyone knows she did it. So that's one perspective. And another kid might have, let's find a guilty one. Let's see, I think Ivy's perspective is guilty, or Rihanna's rather. Rihanna has Ivy's perspective. I heard a big crash and then I saw Maria run out of the room. I think she might've done it. So these are just two perspectives and they gotta decide, was this person, which one has more credibility to it? Which one you know, has some sound evidence to it versus is just more conjecture? And so once they do that, let me come back to, I've, if you're someone who hates lots of tabs, you might wanna look away, I'm sorry. <laughs> so at the end, they um, they share those different perspective cards and then they can scan the QR code, take on that persona. And after about five minutes, I would only let them play about five minutes, you can decide, all right, who, how many you know credible uh, personas do we have out there that she's innocent? How many credible ones do we have that she's guilty? And they can make a decision. Again, I'll give you the spoiler alert that most probably she was guilty in this hypothetical scenario. But the other thing I think is cool about this activity is that once they um, do that, they can look at the different arguments people made and put them on this fallacy chart. So I'll show you that really quick. Um, here are different types of fallacies and they can see these in the different arguments that the different perspectives um, kind of showed. And they get an example of that. And here it is in the case of the vase, right? You can see John's perspective had the fallacy of changing the subject. So, um, and here's sour flower power is the middle school version. It's again, you're trying to decide whether or not this flower that's on this planet actually has healing powers or not. So I think this fallacy chart is a really good way to then take that exercise and turn it into something they can apply long-term in other ways. Okay, those are our four activities. So I wanna take a quick moment here. Remember there's that, do you dare? There is information, is this information crap? Or you can use trap. Um, the quest for the truth, the pirate game, or the cases to crack. So I'm just curious if any of those feel like something that you might want to try with your students. So we'll do a quick poll here to see if any of those are things that you might like to try. Which ones might you try? We'll give you about 15 seconds. <coughs> All right, let's close that out and see what we got, Heather. Yeah, so um, about 38% would like to try Do You Dare, 44% want to try Is This Information Crap, 56% want to try The Quest for Truth, and 56% want to try Cases to Crack. Okay, pretty close there. Um, I'm glad to see those last two. I just think they could be a lot of fun in the classroom, and I would love to see you guys doing it. So if you do it in your classroom, um, take a quick video or a picture and share it with me. I would love that. Um, we've had a lot, of a lot of fun doing it with our own students, and I think it just gets some really good information and, um, and conversations going between your students about what is and isn't credible. A few bonus strategies here. If you feel like that crap protocol is too much with, you know, CRAA, P5, um, different uh, sort of areas to consider, here's a three-question three protocol. So maybe for younger students, you might use this, or if you just want to introduce it more quickly. And that's just, if they're looking at a source, ask these three questions. Who wrote it? Why did they write it? And what do other sources say about it? So those are three questions they can always ask themselves to kind of check the credibility of something. Another one I like to tell students is just the gut check. You know, if you're thinking about what you're looking at compared to other sources, if you're having sort of an overly emotional response to this information, you might be being manipulated. 
So just consider whether or not, you know, does this source make you feel more anxious or scared than other topics, um, than the other sources on this topic? Um, more sad, more urgent, more dire, or more optimistic. It could be positive too, but either way, if it's really kind of giving you this strong emotional response, then that's something to just maybe verify that source. And then lastly, maybe for older students or maybe for yourself, just to kind of see where you're getting your information, there's this media bias chart that I think is really cool. Um, and it just kind of shows you from different me media networks where they fall on the kind of left to right spectrum, um, opinion versus sort of fact reporting spectrum. So that um, link to that is in that hyperdoc as well. So last but not least, I just want to give you a little bit of a look into what this looks like when you kind of implement information literacy as part of a bigger picture. Um, so we have a project that we do with our students that we really love called Take a Stand. So once students kind of understand how to um, kind of evaluate a source and develop a strong opinion, the next thing is to share that opinion with the world, but to do it respectfully and to debate respectfully. And that's what I really love about this project. Um, the students learn how to debate respectfully as they research all sides of a relevant issue and they take position on the issue and then they create a podcast that where they can share their kind of passion or what they've learned about that and their position on it. So I want to show you a video of what this looks like. Um, this is one of those Blue Apple projects. So I'm going to select three people to win this, um, this project or there's nine others. You can pick whichever one you want. But I want to show you this one because I think it kind of ties into information literacy nicely. So this is a two minute video. I'll show you what Take a Stand kind of looks like in the classroom. So I'll show you this two minutes. So in Take a Stand, my kids were able to pick a topic, learn how to debate respectfully with each other, and then they were able to build a podcast and share that issue with other parents and people around the world. Do you have to sit with you to see if they have like a better point? If you're debating, you do it politely. When you're debating, you don't fight like you gotta just like be kind. My kids were able to collaborate and share ideas throughout this whole project. Sometimes she would be like, no, this is better, and I'd be like, why do you think that? And then you kind of have like a mini debate. We think we should spray for triple E because four people have died and ten, ten people have been confirmed in Michigan to have the disease. Yes. My kids were really engaged because they knew they were going to share their podcast with their parents, the community, and the world. So we're all finished with the project for children who are researching. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a look at how, you know, information literacy and research can be taken kind of to the next level of actually acting on that and developing a podcast and debating respectfully. Um, and so I wanted to point out that that, um, that particular project, all the sort of lesson overview for that that you see here is in your HyperDoc. That's totally free. If you want all the resources that come with it, as well as all of the sort of games that are built into it and things like that, um, that's the complete project. It is available for $125, but remember you do get a 10% um, off for um, attending a webinar. So use the webinar code to get that. So that's a little bit on information literacy. I wanna invite you to join us next month. Um, my colleague is gonna kick off a two-part series. We're starting with Beyond the Numbers, Infusing Creativity in Math and Science. And then I'm gonna follow that with Infusing Critical Thinking in English and um, Language Arts and Social Studies. So looking at how we kind of build that creative and critical thinking in those disciplines that maybe don't always seem like they align to that. So she's cooking up some really great stuff. I hope you join us for that and I'll see you again on the next one.
So lastly, like I said, I want to give you a chance to win one of those projects where you could put some of this information literacy um, kind of activities into the broader picture. So as soon as we close out the webinar here, you will be prompted to um, enter a survey. And it's super short, I promise. Okay, it's very quick. It's like a 20-second survey. We'd love to get some feedback on whether this is helpful to you. And by doing so, we'll also enter you to win. And on Friday, I think that's the 19th. What did I say? Yeah, on Friday, I will pick three winners to um, give one of those Blue Apple projects too. So I hope that was helpful to you. Hopefully one of those four activities is something that you might try in your classroom. Like I said, send me, I would love to see how it looks um, and how it's going for you. And I wanna end with this quote just because I'm a Ted Lasso fan, number one, but also particularly when it comes to information literacy, I thought this was apropos to say, for me, or Ted Lasso says, for me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellows be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. And when it comes to information literacy, I think that's something that really helps our students be the best versions of themselves, both in and outside the classroom. So I hope you take some time to implement those and let me know how it goes. And thanks so much for all you're doing in such a tough school year. Um, you don't get told it enough. I really appreciate it. And I know that your students do too. So we'll see you next month. Have a good afternoon.